Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here and for joining us at today's vaccination clinic in West Seattle. I am so glad to be here. By the end of this morning, the Seattle Fire Department will have vaccinated hundreds of Latinx older adults at this site in just two days. Well, this is exciting. It's also been unpredictable. As everyone knows, the flow of vaccine has not been what anyone wanted. And unfortunately, some of this week's supply has been stuck in transit because of the weather in the other parts of the country. We actually had to push this afternoon's clinic until later tomorrow to get more supply in place. But even amongst this evolving vaccination situation, we know the city of Seattle's road to recovery begins with and can only happen with vaccinations. And we also know that we have to be deeply committed to making sure that that vaccination is distributed equitably and we're getting to those communities that have been most impacted by this disease. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely clear that COVID-19, both with its health and its economic impacts, have had a devastating toll on our BIPOC and immigrant and refugee communities. Uh, the focus here in the West Seattle Clinic is really important because in King County, Latinx residents make up 24%, 24% of the confirmed COVID cases and 18% of the hospitalizations. Yet they represent only 10% of King County's population. So let me just say that again, 10% of the population, 24% of the cases, 18% of the hospitalizations. And so far, we've only been able to vaccinate 6.5% of the people who are eligible one of the lowest vaccination rates in King County. And West Seattle, uh, Delridge and Highline also have one of the lowest rates of people over 65 vaccinated at only around 40%. The city of Seattle is really intentionally trying to fill these gaps. And I can't say enough about what the fire department has done to stand up these mobile clinics and the community-based organizations who have stood up and said, if you get us the vaccines, we will get the community members who are eligible there. And I just have to thank them for that. You're gonna hear from one of those great community members here today, um, Greg Garidos, who's talking right after me. But we know that we have to get to 70%, which is a huge undertaking for the city of Seattle. And so the, we've, we're at it, we've, we've vaccinated thousands of people, over 86 adult family homes, 32 affordable housing projects, and seven community pop-ups and as you can see, the firefighters worked in the snow and now they're working in the rain. Uh, and I thank you. So I just want to thank the, everybody. This is a preview of what's to come. When we get enough vaccination, we hope to make this into a permanent community hub where we can have vaccination for West Seattle. And when we get more vaccine, we're going to have mass vaccination sites at convenient locations throughout the city. Rainier Beach, West Seattle, downtown North Seattle. It is going to be so critical for us to do that. I want to give a particular thank you to Councilwoman uh, Lisa Herbold, who's here, not just because it's her district, but because she has been so focused on vaccinations and making sure the distribution is equitable. So thank you, Councilmember Herbold, for your work. And Gray, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone, um, buenos dias. My name is Gray Garrido. I am from the Systems Navigation Coordinator at Via Comunitaria. Um, we're an organization based out in South Park um, and we serve also the Latina community there and in the rest of King County. Um, we mainly offer our services to undocumented folks. We offer a variety of resources and through our programs. To name a few, we have labor laws, housing, food, health, and citizenship programs. We at Via Comunitaria have, since the pandemic started, dedicated ourselves to spreading awareness of the virus as well as information on the vaccine because we know firsthand how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected black and brown members of our community. Um, and how a lot of the times the language surrounding the vaccine and this virus um, have been very alienating and difficult to understand for our undocumented folks. We at Via Comunitaria are very proud to have been recognized for our community work by the City of Seattle and the Seattle Fire Department and have been asked to um, help make this pop-up site successful. We hope that we can continue working with the City and the Fire Department to um, vaccinate our most vulnerable members as more phases continue to roll out. Um, and so thank you. I will now introduce Amy Lee Darifal. Great, Thanks. thank you, Greg.
Well, I'm really excited to be here. I'm Amy Lee Derenthal with the Senior Center of West Seattle and just really appreciate you, Mayor Durkin and Councilmember Herbold and Chief Scoggins and um, the whole uh, Public Health, King County, Seattle, the whole team um, for making it possible for the for the Senior Center. It's just so wonderful to participate with the city with this. Because what we um, do at the Senior Center is provide essential services during the pandemic. So we've been feeding people, delivering lunches, doing foot care, um, have a food bank distribution, all the things people need. And over the last few months or last few weeks, what we've been hearing is that people are calling our social workers, since we have a great social worker team, and saying, how do I get the vaccination? How do I do this? And it's really, really hard. And what we identified is there's this group of vulnerable seniors who don't have internet at home. Even if they did, they don't know how to go online and be able to get um, themselves signed up to get a vaccination. It's very confusing, it's very hard. There are also people who don't have family members or somebody to come and help them out. So having this partnership when we got the call, um, also on Friday, that we could bring some of these people in, our social workers just picked up the phone and the biggest thing was to be able to reach out to them. They were just so happy to be able to have somebody just talk them through how to get signed up, get them signed up. And then we had board and staff members. We delivered about 50 people here between yesterday and today that are of this special group of people, you know, 75 and older who just don't have the internet access um, to be able to come here. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you for that work and for that piece. Um, and that's why we're so happy to be here today. And also a giant thank you to the firefighters. Um, I can say that there's just this relief on people's faces too. The seniors are nervous, they're afraid. Um, and they get here and they see the firefighters and bam, all of a sudden they're um, feeling a lot better and feel good about it. So just a special thank you to the firefighters. And a thank you to our board and staff. Um, we did have our board reach out and try and get the voice of these people who are not heard. They're living at home. They're not in the retirement communities or in the low income housing. They're at home. And so there's nobody standing up for them. So um, we were able to do that from the senior center. I'm proud of that. And um, just really thank Lisa for listening and helping us make it happen. And just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And now I get to introduce Chief Scoggins to share with you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to start off by thanking our mayor for her leadership, support, and her push for our fire department to get this work done. Because none of that work would be possible without our leader providing direction for us. I also want to thank our partners, the University of Washington and Seattle King County Public Health. As we have heard day after day of the shortage of vaccines, I know our team has been scrambling to continue to meet the need. As I see Brian Wallace back there, if you can put your hand up, Brian, and Sarah Smith. You know, as I walked up this morning, we're still facing another shortage. Sarah was on the phone with our partners trying to solve the problem, as we've been trying to do for the last year. So it's really important. We've tested over 631,000 people for COVID-19 in the last you know, year or so, or less than a year. Over 71,000 people have been tested at this site alone. Yesterday, we we're so excited to turn on the vaccination process. Our mobile vaccination teams have been out in community since January 14th. We visited over 130 different facilities, and now we're opening up two lanes at this testing site for vaccination. So it's a lot of partnerships that go into that, but as we continue to solve the problems that are ahead of us, your fire department will be here to support community. And I'll just close with that. Our firefighters have been working around the clock to continue to meet the needs of the community. And I couldn't be prouder of the work that we're doing each and every day. Because while we're focusing on testing and vaccinations in 2020, we still responded to over 80,000 emergency calls for service. Over 65,000 of those were for EMS calls, along with all the other things that we're doing. So we're really proud of the work that our team does. And I'll leave it there and I'm honored to introduce Council Member Lisa Herbel. So it's really great to be here. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in my office and my staff do a lot of work explaining to people why they can't get an appointment. And it's really gratifying to actually be able to um, offer folks who have been struggling to get appointments um, a, a, a solution and a solution that I'm confident is going to, to grow with time as access to vaccine increases. Again, um, many people um, don't understand that it, it, the, the ability to 
uh, deliver vaccines is, is not about not having a site or a location to do vac mass vaccination. And so, um, whereas it's great to be able to explain to people where the, where the uh, bottleneck is, it is cold comfort, I think, for a lot of folks who feel very helpless and feel like they don't have anybody standing up for them. And that's why I, I really want to thank the advocacy um, of organizations like Villa Communitaria and the West Seattle Senior Center for allowing me to give voice to the needs of their clients. Um, between the West Seattle Bridge closure, uh, significant congestion on detour routes off of the peninsula, and limited access to the lower level bridge, District 1 residents are virtually cut off from vaccine and healthcare providers. Unfortunately, the reality is, is that the vaccination rollout has been marked nationally and locally by institutional inequities already rampant in our healthcare system. Those most at risk of COVID have been crowded out of the line to receive these very scarce doses. And so that's why it's so important that the city is stepping up to bridge those gaps and to ensure that vaccine access is focused on the folks who are most at risk um, of, of, of health scares and, and deaths. You know, we learned this morning that the life expectancy um, has changed in the last year. The average life expectancy um, has been reduced by one year for the general population, by two years for La the Latinx population, and by three years for African American populations. On Tuesday, the council passed a resolution affirming that vaccine must be prioritized for those most impacted by the pandemic and ensuring that we use data to quickly address these inequities. Today's pop-up is part of the city's effort to do just that. And planning continues to support more vaccination sites, both pop-ups like today's and mass vaccination sites in the future. Again, the main constraint on the city's ability to vaccinate everyone is the lack of vaccine. As the federal government slowly increases its delivery of vaccines over the next several months, the city will set up additional vaccination sites serving District 1 and others who have trouble accessing vaccine on their own. I really appreciate that the city is targeting its few doses that they receive each week, about a thousand doses a week, um, and targeting them to where they're most needed. And I really um, want to echo everyone's thanks to the Seattle Fire Department, which was the first fire and emergency medical services agency in the state to be approved to administer COVID-19 vaccine. They've already vaccinated residents at 13 of the District 1 adult family homes that are not, um, uh, that are not served by the Federal Par Pharmacy Partnership. And I also want to thank all the other city workers who have been involved in vaccinating residents and all the advocates who are speaking up to identify and solve vaccine access problems. And I want to also, of course, thank our mayor, who, as Chief Scoggins said, none of this would be possible without her leadership. Thank you. All right, I know if there's any questions. I, I just want to confirm again. Look, the city has done um, over 4,500 4, vaccinations about, and 70% of them have been in our BIPOC communities. We are really trying to intentionally fill those gaps, and it's everybody who would be eligible. We don't want people to, to have, you know, I, I, the, I can't thank the community groups enough because they're trusted partners. They know people, people trust them. Getting people to these sites is not always easy. And I am very much looking forward to the day when we don't need a press conference to talk about vaccinations because it is so widely available and y'all won't have to be standing in the rain. So any questions? To anybody up here too. Yeah, um, looking back, are there any Yeah, I think one of the things that people don't understand is unlike PPE and testing, which we went out and got on the market ourselves because we couldn't get it through the sources, you have to get the vaccine through the system that the federal government has set up. It is a literal monopoly and they're sending it all to the state's Department of Health who allocated out. 
So we're very reliant on our relationship and good relationship with the State Department of Health and Seattle King County Public Health to get any vaccine. We also don't control the appointment process. And so they allocated some to hospitals, some to pharmacies, some to the city, some to public health. It's incredibly confusing. And so we've been working with the state and with some of our companies and tech partners trying to find a way that we can have a unified system that's very easy for people that we, you know, they just instituted a certain number of phone call appointments people could make because they don't have access to the internet. But even that is a barrier for people because there's language barriers. There's um, understanding, you know, how to get to and from the appointment. How do you, you know, what's the transit that's available? So the city's done all it's could. We, you know, we're, we're a little bit on the bottom of the heap in terms of distribution and influence, but we've now been working much more closely to try to see how we can help correct some of this stuff because we won't be successful if we don't do that. And it's one reason why I'm so focused on the relationship we have with our community-based organizations and why the equity fund we set up to support them because those communities are not only the most impacted, many of them have the most reason to distrust government. And for government to come say, yes, come get vaccinated, they, they won't have that trust without the community partner. So I think that we're in a good position once we get vaccine, we just need more of the juice. So given that the last of the June, do you think that the state can open up the uh, phases so widely You know, I don't want to speak for, for, for the different phases, and I don't have all the information at a statewide glance as to why that was important for the state. What I do know is it, we're in a scarcity mode right now, and everybody is frustrated. Everybody I know. I mean, when you read stories about someone walking, 90-year-old walking three miles in the snow so she won't miss her appointment, um, and, and other people who are struggling and not knowing how to get an appointment, we got to fix it. We are working, we're totally aligned with public health so that when we are able to do more, they're very complimentary and we are scouting locations. I have the, the chief is out regularly. We have the good news is people have stepped up and say, use our spot, use our place. Um, and we're really trying to be make sure that we have them in various locations so that they're easy to get to. And we will still have our mobile teams because we have to have an and and strategy. Because even with mass vaccination sites, there'll be many people who can't get there. And so we're still going to be the strategies of both. Mayor, can you talk a little bit more about the frustration of these vaccines being delayed, especially because of the snowstorms across the country? I mean, it just makes it so much more difficult for people to get a chance to come in. It is. Look, it feels like 2020 is still working its magic on us, you know, and doing everything it can to undermine. Um, I am very hopeful that, you know, by late spring, there will really be a much broader access to vaccination. And by April, May and June, there'll be broad, broad access. And so hopefully then, you know, this will be a bad memory. But then that's when we're going to turn to and really need our community based organizations, because there are many people who will be resistant to being vaccinated um, and for, for many good reasons. And we can't reopen till we get to that number. And so we're gonna need all of us working together. I spoke to a couple of people who were vaccinated today. They said they had been turned away by their physicians because they were not eligible. But when they reach out to a committee, they were able to get the appointment. Is this a feature or a bug? My guess is that there's a lot of confusion in the, and that's why this kind of program is so important to have people close to members of the community and be able to spend the time if they don't have internet access or language access and, and make sure that you know that they are eligible and then get them vaccinated. And so I think there's been so much information out there about number one, it is really hard to get appointments. You know, you've got to be almost a, a digital Hunger Games pro to do it. Um, and so I think that just says again how important it is the relationships with the senior centers and community-based organizations who have connections with people and can help them through that process. Who checks eligibility? Say again? Who checks for eligibility? The eligibility is that in the forms they fill out, they have to be eligible. So it's not a way to jump the line. But as we heard today, there's so many seniors who aren't in senior uh, long-term care facilities or adult family homes. They're living by themselves in isolation. 
and some of their only connections to community is like through the, the, the West Seattle uh, Center. And so having those connections is really going to improve this. Yeah, there's a there is a process and form they have to fill out for for eligibility, and then it's entered in the system. What are the language barrier, Mayor, that you talked about in the Latino population specifically? Are you having issues bringing people here as of today, or we're getting out of the I'm going to let you address that. Um, so at Via Comunitaria, we actually have a lot of our seniors living in multi-generational family homes. And so we found that the best course of action that we um, took was to make a Facebook post through Via Comunitaria. And that way, um, either the sons or the daughters or the grandkids of these seniors were then able to reach out to us and say, hey, I have my grandma, she's 75, I need to get her signed up. And then we were able to go through that process. And so a lot of the language barriers were myself and two other bilingual um, health specialists at Via Comunitaria were the ones that were administering all the calls to make sure that language was not the issue because the site that we make the appointments through is only in English. And so that was one of the obstacles. Yeah. Appointment -based so um, we actually had like the, um, we were told by the city not to release the site. And so only we at Via Comunitaria had that access. And so people had to call us in order to get that appointment through us. And so um, if people now were to see it, then they would call us and we would add them to a white list so that hopefully the next time that we have another vaccination pop up, we are then able to contact those folks that didn't reach that quota. Yes, we already have people that didn't make it to the site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and Chief Scoggins noted for me as well, we've got a translator here on premises too, to help people. And we've seen from the data that, um, that the number one language um, gap right now is, um, is for our Latinx community. And so we've been pr trying to do extra resource. Obviously there's a number of language capabilities in the city of Seattle. You know, we've got to have Chinese and other things like that, but we're trying to really tailor both the ability to make the reservation in multiple languages and the vaccinations and any help people need while they're there. Any more questions? Just a question for the chief. Are there any plans to do, I know you've been going to uh, home, uh, low income housing, um, but are there any plans to go to individual homes? Is anybody doing that for people who live by themselves and might not have a family member? Sure, we don't have plans to go to individual homes right now, and we're still focusing on the um, adult family homes for the second doses, other congregate living situations. But right now, we don't have plans to go to any individual homes. That may happen in the future, but right now, that, that's not our target. Our team's also out doing second doses. Um, you know, we've been doing this since January 14th. So, you know, that group is now getting their second doses, just like everyone here who's getting them today. 28 days from now, they'll be coming back to get the second doses. So we're working on two fronts right now. Um, I can tell you King County um, Public Health is has begun to collect um, a list of homebound seniors. Um, we've been referring folks directly to them. They have not yet begun visiting them, but they are um, developing a list. And my guess is the chief doesn't know this yet, but I think we'll be, once we finally have enough vaccine, the medics will have it with them. And so if they're called out for a call, they'll be able to check, has someone been vaccinated? If not, try to get them vaccinated. I mean, we're gonna have to use every step and every tool we have to really do that. I think people, when they see doctors, that's gonna become a regular part of the protocol, um, checking whether people have vaccinations. And so you're gonna see it at various entrance points to the system so that we can try to get to those people who might not be connected. So just to be clear about how it works when say if the supply is delayed because of weather, the appointments today will be rescheduled by either an organization that handles those appointments or the, or the state or the county to be at a number. Correct. Depending on the system and the hospitals are doing that too. For example, there was a number of uh, vaccination um, sites that with the heavy snows had to be rescheduled. So they had to contact a number of people and change it to a different hour. And so, look, we're all trying to go with the flow right now, um, and or no flow. <laughs> um, and but hopefully, you know, once we have this behind us. But I just have to really say, even with the uncertainty that we've had, 
King County Public Health, the University of Washington and the fire department have made such an important bond through the whole testing sites we've set up in this process that when we fall short, they look to see where they might have extra. Um, and there's been a really strong push by, I think, all of the community to make sure that these kinds of events continue to happen because they know how important they are for equity. We have time for one more question. Mayor, can you comment on the uh, Jaeger settlement on what it means for the homeless effort? I think that that was a settlement based big, totally on nuisance value of the lawsuit and did not reflect anything on the merits. Um, I've not had a chance to talk to the city attorney about it yet. Um, but we were confident on the merits of the case, but sometimes uh, the city attorney decides that it may be best to resolve something to move forward. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.